good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to all to our uh, spotlight uh, webinar uh, that will be devoted to COP26 and uh, what it means uh, for brand marketers. My name is Stefan Lok. I'm the CEO of the WFA, and it's a pleasure uh, to welcome you to our webinar. Now, sustainability has been for a long time um, not necessarily a top priority for CMOs and therefore hasn't been necessarily a top priority for WFA. And that has changed uh, very radically and drastically um, two years ago. Two years ago now, um, um, we have um, measured how um, CMOs are prioritizing now sustainability. They consider it to be one of their top priorities for the next five years. And um, the leadership um, in marketing and in companies is very much focused now on understanding the implications of sustainability and the climate change agenda in particular. WFA has launched uh, the Planet Pledge um, in April um, 2021, so um, almost seven months ago now. And um, many of you um, hopefully are now familiar with the Planet Pledge. If not, let me just very quickly summarize what those commitments are all about. So Planet Pl the Planet Pledge is a commitment, um, or rather four commitments, made by chief marketing officers. Um, the first um, commitment, which is the foundation of the Planet Pledge, is a commitment for the company to become climate neutral by 2050. So it's a very significant commitment that uh, incorporates the entire company. CMOs also commit to encourage their agency partners, as well as more generally the marketing supply chain, to emulate them and to equally commit to be a CO, a CO2 neutral by 2050. The second um, commitment um, they're signing up to is a commitment to um, scale um, um, knowledge and, um, and, and in particular address the significant gap there is still today um, in terms of understanding the implications of uh, climate uh, change and of the climate agenda for marketing. So it's a commitment to train and upskill um, marketing teams. The third commitment is about leveraging marketing communications, marketing creativity, marketing innovation in order to drive uh, consumer behavior change. And the fourth commitment is to do so in a manner that is fair, that is uh, not misleading, that is objective, that is accountable, and therefore that avoids the trap of uh, greenwashing. Now, I'm delighted to say that um, uh, as of today, we have 21 of the most admired brand owners in the world, which have signed up to um, the Planet Pledge. And that number is increasing. There will be um, a few um, announcements in the, in the coming weeks, but it's great to see some of the most um, uh, admired um, uh, brands um, and, and, and some of the most um, visible um, CMOs in our industry having signed up to the, to the Planet Pledge. We also um, are delighted to say that um, 24 of our national associations have actually signed up to become strategic partners to the Planet Pledge. So they are um, basically leading the Planet Pledge initiative at the local level, and they are um, going to be um, championing the Planet Pledge with local marketers. The idea being that we gain scale both globally and locally in partnership with our national associations in order to move the needle. That's the, that's the objective we have with um, the, the Planet Pledge. Now, it won't have escaped you um, unless you haven't um, uh, consumed any media in the last two months that COP26 has ended um, almost uh, two weeks ago now in Glasgow. Not since Paris in 2015 um, have we seen a um, climate um, summit get that uh, level of attention all around the world. Um, but this was actually the first time uh, WFA went um, to a climate summit. Um, and we wanted to share with you um, what decisions were taken and how we think they will be impacting brand marketers going forward. Now, um, I have the pleasure of uh, being joined today uh, by Gail Galley. Uh, Gail is the founder of Project 17. She is uh, the uh, partner um, of uh, the Planet Pledge, she and her team. 
And Gail is going to bring her immense expertise when it comes to the climate agenda and the sustainability agenda for us to properly understand the implications of the decisions that were made uh, in COP26 and also understand the dynamic we're going to be seeing in the months you know, to come. Now, um, before we jump into um, the program, I'd like to ask a question to our attendees. Um, and, and that question is um, whether you feel brand marketers and brand owners should be at COP26, just to get a sense of how relevant you think um, a climate summit like COP26 um, is for brand marketers and whether that's a place for them to be. And here we go. Yes, brand owners and marketers have, um, have to play a leadership role and should be at COP26. That's a pretty resounding endorsement. Um, and that's a good start for, um, for what we're going to be doing in the, um, in the next um, few minutes. The COP26 was delayed by year for, for the reasons we know, um, the pandemic, um, and, uh, and it was actually even uncertain until a few weeks before it was held. But it was repeatedly described by some of the most um, knowledgeable and respected um, um, climate scientists as being uh, the last chance uh, for our planet to, um, to come back on track in order to help contain the rise of uh, temperatures to 1.5 uh, degrees above pre-industrial levels. Now, the um, COP26 chair, um, Mr. Alok Sharma, put it actually uh, very bluntly. He said, the decisions we make on climate change and the actions we take by 2030 are uh, basically going to set the trajectory for future generations. Though so a, 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 a very clear um, moment of truth when it comes to um, um, understanding the potential implications of not taking action or not taking sufficient action in order to um, help um, contain the rise of uh, temperatures. Now, despite the available evidence, um, the vast majority of countries continue to fall short of their commitments, the commitments they took back in, in 2015, and uh, CO2 emissions have kept rising, um, even uh, despite the lockdowns in 2020, um, uh, due to the pandemic. And not surprising, the pressure has been growing um, spectacularly, both on countries and on businesses to take decisive action. And that's the background against which um, I decided to, um, to travel to Glasgow um, and, and participate in this uh, climate summit. I um, actually traveled by um, night train. I hadn't done that in, in many, many years. I took the Cal Caledonian um, uh, sleeper, the London Glasgow night train, to be totally honest, not necessarily as comfortable as other means of transportation, but certainly much more sustainable, a fraction of the CO2 footprint of, um, of, a, uh, of a plane journey. Now, Glasgow, that's actually a beautiful city of Glasgow. I haven't seen Glasgow under that angle, but Glasgow um, is, is definitely an unlikely place to hold a, um, a climate summit. Um, I, I haven't seen a tram, I haven't seen I think a hybrid taxi, I haven't seen um, many electric cars and I've seen plenty of traffic jams in Glasgow. Um, so an unlikely place to, um, to hold a, a, a summit. However, um, the summit did live up um, to um, its promises and uh, at least for me. Um, and if I had to sort of um, um, summarize uh, what a climate summit is all about or my impression of what the climate summit is, uh, having spent three days here, I'd say it's an improbable gathering of plenty of people uh, from all around the world. Um, they are scientists, they are NGOs, they are politicians, they are business leaders, CEOs, um, tech entrepreneurs. It's, a, it's an incredible mix of people and they have a shared commitment and that is to, um, to um, curb um, the rise of uh, temperature um, on, on our planet. And there is, an, there is a, a lot of energy and passion that is that is almost perceptible um, in, in, in many of those gatherings. Um, um, lots of unexpected conversations, um, um, uh, lots of unlikely encounters, and, um, and, and in a way, um, a very sort of energizing experience to be seeing um, such a diverse group of people determined to, um, to play a constructive role. Now, um, Gail and I have tried to sort of digest what, what, we, what we think we learned in Glasgow in a manner that is, um, that is succinct uh, and that is, that is relevant to, to brand marketers. And um, so we, we're going to be talking about three themes which we think are 
are the key themes from a brand marketer perspective um, in order to, to fully understand the implications of, um, of, of COP26. So the first one is going to be around um, government policy, basically the stuff that happened in the blue zone and the commitments that global leaders took or didn't take uh, in order to contain um, the rise of temperatures. We'll then talk about uh, business and tech and why it actually is incredibly important. Didn't necessarily get that much press coverage, but incredibly important beyond the sort of more political or geopolitical um, talks. And the third one is going to be around people and leadership and, um, and understand um, what that means for, uh, for us as, as business leaders. So um, let me start with um, the... Um, with with the with the global leaders. So going to COP, um, it be, it became well known that life on our planet um, can only thrive if it remains within the nine planetary boundaries developed by Professor Rockstrom. Those of you who were in global marketing will remember Professor Rockstrom. He, he he's one of the climate scientists climate scientists who really has helped understand this notion of boundaries, planet boundaries, and the importance. Of making sure that we uh, we we don't go beyond because they can have incredibly um, uh, important systemic uh, um, impacts on on the future of our planet. So um, the commitments um, made um, at the conference, as suspected, fell short of what is needed in order to ensure um, um, a, um, a containment of the rise of temperatures to uh, 1.5 degrees. However. There was enough progress in Glasgow, and I think that's really important to hear. There was enough progress in Glasgow to keep the 1.5 degree alive. Okay, that is that is what that's in in short. In one sentence, that is the outcome of Glasgow. You know? so it, it was it was more than expected, but not enough to succeed. And it keeps actually that uh, that 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 trajectory possible on the basis of the commitments provided those commitments are being delivered on, yeah. Um, now, part of the success of Glasgow is, um, is actually uh, the decisions which were taken on fossil fuels and the fact that some of the largest economies in the world decided to phase out or just you now the last minute changes to the resolution by China and India, which changed the wording of phase out to phase down um, uh, so it's a, it's a weaker resolution than was what was, was hoped for, but a clear commitment to um, to uh, bring to an end coal is a very significant commitment um, for for the future. Now, an, another key theme um, in COP26 was nature, um, and for the first time in COP history, biodiversity had actually a a seat at the table. Um, some of you may have picked up uh, that there was an announcement during the COP that countries representing 85% of um, the total um, uh, world's forests have made a commitment to stop deforestation by 2030. So these are, this is all, again, a very significant announcement, uh, provided again, it is, it is being delivered on. Now, Gail, um, what were your reflections um, on these policy announcements in Glasgow? And, and what's your take overall on, uh, on the outcomes of Glasgow? Thanks, Stefan, and, and uh, thanks again for having me here. Hi, everyone. And Stefan, it was great to have you in Glasgow with us. It's it's weird when you're in it, uh, and because you, it takes time to then reflect on what happened with any kind of um, outside. But I think on back, I went into COP assuming that this side of things was going to be dreadful. Like I, I really, um, there's a there's a huge dread amongst all of the community that 1.5 was going to truly collapse. So that was a good thing. Um, I think that. Really good progress was made on all the points you uh, mentioned there. For me, uh, as, as she often does, the, the lady, the architect of the Paris Agreement, who's a, a woman called Christiana Figueres, who runs uh, Global Optimism, she wrote about the COP afterwards with a fantastic uh, analogy. She said, you know, there is a, if there was a bus careering down the road and a child was in the way, every one of us would leap to save the child. Now, obviously, in her analogy, uh, climate change is the bus and, and we are, the earth is the child. And she said, you know, you wouldn't stand around watching the bus. Stefan and I would not be arguing about if there was a bus there or not. Why was it coming? Whose fault is it? You know, what, what's the best way to save the child? You would just react as, as fast as you could. And her and her use of that analogy for this cop was at least everybody now agrees there's a bus coming. 
and and the, the race is on to save the child now and, and in her in immense experience that has never happened before with such clarity and intensity and alignment so I feel like even though you know we of course we could have had more commitments the coal one could have been stronger particularly but we did get alignment and the energy was all pointing at the same direction you know all pointing at the same child as it were there just were disagreements about how fast a movement we needed to make but but there was no disagreement that movements needed to happen so that I came away feeling quite good about um, and then just to pick up one more point that you have raised, Stefan, is, is the nature point. Um, I've not been to so many COPs, but uh, apparently that really is a new thing, that nature-based solutions are part of the 1.5 story. You know, the fossil fuel reduction side of things is about half, if you if you're to like, look into the science. Nature-based solutions are a huge part of the um, of the answer, and they were being discussed with, with equal uh, relevance and scientific rigor. I think we'll hear a lot more about it next year. Um, I think there's, there's a couple of very big UN moments next year to look at biodiversity and, and how can we set meaningful targets. I think that has huge implications for, for businesses, especially consumer-based businesses and marketers. Um, and I think that... For me, the outstanding change at COP was that that nature dialogue was very much being led by the indigenous peoples of the world, not as kind of pinups in the way the WWF might use a panda, something that needs to be protected, but actually as genuine respected experts in how we manage the land. The, the statistic I remember was 85% of the forests that we need to protect are managed by indigenous peoples. And yet, you know, they have nowhere near 85% of the decision seats, but they have none. But they came with such humility and um, compassion, actually. And to hear them speak, and I was lucky enough to hear them speak several times, was really uh, encouraging. The fact that they're there and that they're being taken seriously because they have they have the wisdom to design the nature-based solutions. They've been doing it for years. So so two bits of optimism for me. We all agree there's a bus coming and and nature is, is fully recognized as being an, an equal partner in this fight. Thank you, Gail. Now, um, the, the the second theme which which I want which we want to discuss with you is um, is is the presence of business, and 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 the way business and tech are are going to be driving um, the uh, climate agenda going forward. I mean, all the participants in in the, in the climate summit in, in Glasgow, and particularly the veterans, those who've done a few others, felt that Glasgow was different compared to others because of the of the of the business presence. And the and, and the way business was embracing that um, that climate agenda, and um, so really really interesting to look at uh, what we've heard from business. And I want to highlight um, uh, two or three things. One is um, this figure of 130 trillion dollars. You may have heard of it because uh, it was very present in in many many media. So what's this 130 trillion dollars? It's certainly a lot of money. <laughs> it's a big amount. Um, it is actually um, um, the the um, the commitment by 450 financial organizations, anything from investment banks to retail banks to insurance companies, etc., um, that control in total that amount of money to actually uh, back clean technology, such as renewable energy, and to direct finance away from the fossil fuel um, industry. That is a very significant financial commitment. Um, just for you to put that into perspective, we're talking about 60% of total financial assets in the world. No? So we're talking about more than half of the total available financial assets. So it's, it's, a, it's a very significant um, 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 financial commitment. The, um, the other um, um, uh, announcement, which, which, which I'd like to report on, um, there, were, there were many um, during that week, but, but the other one, which, which might not sound spectacular, but apparently has huge um, uh, longer term um, uh, repercussions, is the announcement by the global accounting body, IFRS, um, who shared that by 2023, they will create and operationalize global standards for companies to report on environmental, social, and governance criteria. Um, um, Emmanuel Faber, who's the former CEO of Danone, who's a very well-known um, uh, business leader, described that, uh, that announcement as um, game-changing. And he said, this is going to synchronize Wall Street with the planet. The idea here is um, for companies to report, among other things, ar um, around their environmental impact and footprint in a manner that is accountable, so auditable by third parties, and comparable 
across countries, given it's a global standard. So potentially um, an, a, an important announcement. Gail, what is your what is your take on those announcements from from the business and, and tech community? It's slightly nuanced. I mean, it's a huge number, right? That first one you talked about, the 130 trillion. So just to be clear, that's not new money that's coming into the system. That is that represents all the assets under management that are now being managed within a 1.5 degree scenario. So you know, so that is good, uh, but it just made me reflect on how humans behave when they have to do something versus when they want to do something. So that number represents, you know, thousands of asset managers, thousands of investors who have been convinced that uh, if you invest in a green future, you're going to get a better return than if you invest in a black one, for example, in, you know, in the old, old in asset classes and industries. And so they want to do that. And I know that Mark, and we worked a bit together on the announcement, Mark Carney has been working on that message for quite a while. Um, and people have come to it because it's exciting, right? It's about innovation and change, and, and, and I, so they want to be part of it. The number that isn't up there that you, you didn't reference because it didn't happen in the end, but it was much trailed, was a much smaller number. Uh, people were looking for $100 billion to come from the developed governments to fund the uh, developing world's just transitions, you know, to really help those fossil fuel dependent nations in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and part states of India and, and so forth. And that didn't emerge. So the developed governments did not, could not find it in their budgets or strategies to reach 100 billion of support. And, and isn't it interesting? That's because it feels like a duty. You know, that's, I have to do that. And it's harder to do than what I want to do. And the reason I pull this out as my reflection to all this is, for me, it's an example of the power of marketing, right? Mark Garney, who is a very good uh, strategist and marketer, he's been marketing this story to the investment community for several years, actually, but with particular intensity in the last 18 months, really selling this story of investment in a green future is a better future for everyone and you'll get a better return. So he's marketed that number and look, people have bought it. And it's come out as a success and it is a success and it will be amazing and it will fund lots of fantastic innovation and technology. So to, and then the hundred billion was very badly marketed because it remained on the table as a bit of a duty that in the end we didn't get to. So I think relevant, so relevant for this audience is um, that represents a, a success of marketing to me, the hundred and thirty trillion. And it's it's we need to find a way of telling the entire climate story as something that humans can't wait to do as opposed to something they have to do. Thank you, Gail. And I think it's indeed really important that we that we look at the outcomes of um, of COP26 in, in a nuanced fashion. Uh, so there are there are definitely you know um, elements for hope, and then there are there are disappointments. And and the fact that uh, industrial countries weren't able to come up with the needed amount, hundred billion dollars, in order to help accelerate the transition, is is certainly among the the disappointments. Um, the the third um, theme we'd like to uh, touch upon is is people and leadership. Um, we um, um, we have um, sorry. Um, in terms of the, there's there's one thing which 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 I find particularly interesting, um, and it's a it's a it's a climate um, summit participant who um, uh, who shared it with me uh, just in order to get a, a sort of um, sense of of what's needed in terms of efforts going forward until 2021 roughly 80% of reductions in CO2 emissions has been generated through technology. So it has been made possible through technological progress and 20% through uh, behavior change. Going forward, if we want to be meeting the objectives, uh, reaching the objectives of um, 2030, we will have to significantly increase um, um, our ability to change consumer behavior 50% of those CO2 emission reduction by 2030 will have to be delivered through consumer behavior change. And that is where marketers will have a key role to play in order to help, uh, help society achieve um, its objective. Now, the, the other, um, um, I think, big learning is um, Global leadership or the lack of global leadership was certainly on display uh, in Glasgow. Um, lots of geopolitical rivalry, which which uh, at times makes progress frustratingly slow, um, certainly in, in the face of the urgency uh, we're confronted with. And the need um, to be looking at all the other stakeholders in this debate, you know, what is called the non-state actors, 
So from companies to cities to regions in terms of accelerating that progress and at times compensating for the absence of, um, of, um, of leadership. And um, finally, future generations, one of the, so we, we, we had plenty of um, climate activists in Glasgow. So Greta Thunberg and, uh, and the climate activists, of course, were, were present in numbers. But then there was also a different type of activist present in the meetings, in the gatherings. That is one of the, my 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 most my strongest memories um, in COP twenty six is 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 the, the 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 Gen Z and millennials not not only who are climate activists but who are actively driving change who are actually coming up with technology and with 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 personal commitment in order to be making a make, making a change some of the most inspiring um, people I've I've actually met uh, I actually met in in Glasgow um, so truly um, refreshing and encouraging to be seeing. Uh, the, the new generation not only advocate but also also take responsibility for them for some of those um, for those for some of those changes. Um, Gail, what is what is your take on um, on what you've seen in terms of uh, leaders and leadership in COP26? So again, agree with you. There was a fantastic representation from uh, the next generation, especially considering how hard it was to get there with the pandemic and restrictions and funding and all the rest of it. So that was a, a brilliant thing. And also by and large, I thought a, a peaceful thing. You know, they, I was worried in advance it would be very aggressive, but there is definitely, a, and again, Christiana actually summed this up very well. She called it a tale of two cities. You know, on the one hand, you have a, a fantastically committed, more than ever before, business leadership community and politicians there too, all acting together and making some really dramatic progress and, and partnerships and innovations and probably feeling pretty good about themselves, right? And as, as they are allowed to do, because we know how hard it is to shift these huge companies in, in a different direction. So on the one hand, that you know, that's great. But if you're Greta and Fridays for Future, you're just screaming saying but where I come from people are dying now you know people are already losing lives and livelihoods how can you stand on stage and, and make any kind of announcement you know if, and anyone's got a teenager knows that teenagers are pretty kind of black and white especially when they're on a, one of their sort of woke issues so but and they're both right right because I, I mean I know Vanessa Nakate quite well and she's a she's an activist too from Uganda who has been really strong throughout her short career as an activist about the impact now on people in her country you know there are two million people starving now because of climate climate impacts so she finds it very difficult to listen to the head of a food company or chemicals company talking about what they're going to do in five years time but they're both completely right so for me what is a real challenge coming out of this but i think there's desire and energy on both sides is when, what is the story that we can tell down the middle of that that is a positive and a constructive one so that all that energy gets taken in the right to, to the right direction. So that was one of my uh, big sort of feelings coming out is that how do we balance that up? And then my second most provocative thought, actually, I whilst I was there, the thing that provoked me the most, and Stefan, we were together at this at the round table with EY on, on the concept of greenwashing, you know, again, very, very relevant to a marketing audience, extremely difficult to get right. Uh, at what point do you claim or set a target in public before you know what you're doing to get there. And you know, that was a lively debate about, about the pros and cons of, of that. And a new phrase emerged that I thought was really interesting and resonated for me, which is what do you want? What's worse, greenwashing or green hushing? So the, the green hush would be that you don't say anything for fear of being shot down or criticized or, or even anti-competitive. And therefore you say nothing about your intention, which widens that divide with the young people because they think you're doing nothing. So what's, you know, and, and doesn't create a sort of positive halo effect of other people thinking, oh, well, that, that's happening. Therefore that must be possible. I must be inspired to do my own part. So there's that tension there between green washing and green hushing. And I definitely come out of this on the um, green hushing is the greater danger. You know, better to give it a go, <laughs> better to make a bold target and be transparent alongside it. I think that's where the breakfast ended up, which is, Everyone could be transparent about what they're trying to do. You know, perfection is very hard in this field. Different companies start at different places and have different sectors and legacy problems to deal with when it comes uh, to green issues. But everyone could be transparent. And I think that is the bridge actually into this young generation because they just think we're all liars, right? They, the, the young uns just think that you, you say that, but are you doing it? You know, you say you've done it as hard as you can, but have you? So I think if companies can commit to being bold about their targets and ambitions, but also transparent about what it is they're doing to get there, then I think we'd probably find that happy space down the middle. Thank you, Gail. Now, um, 
what does all this mean for us, us brand marketers? So let's let's try and let's try and um, get to um, get to the get to the core of it. Um, I left I left um, Glasgow with the conviction that one there's a real urgency. No, to to Gail's point, no, there is actually no time left. Companies and brands will have a key role to play, as all needs to happen now. Uh, so it's not a question of not trying to figure out what 2040 looks like. It, it needs to happen now. Um, a, a summit participant put it to me very simply. He, he, he sort of just to put it into perspective and get a few figures. No? Um, in order to meet our objectives um, um, by 2030, the world needs to cut by um, its CO2 emissions by 29 gigatons per year in 2030. The commitments we've heard in Glasgow represent 12 to 14, so roughly half of what's needed. Okay, so there's no, there's no, no, there's no doubt that more is going to be needed in the years to come. But it's roughly half of um, of what's needed. Um, we have um, asked um, our um, CMOs um, and and those who've signed actually the plan pledge in particular. We've asked them to share with us. Um, what what they think needs to needs to stop in terms of how what that means for for the way they look at at marketing, and so this is what they told us the sort of top five things they need to they think needs to be changed and, and stopped. One is they feel that sustainability as a constraint that's not that that needs to be stopped. This vision of this is a constraint to my existing business model. No, sustainability is actually the future. The future may be uncomfortable, but it's simply the future. So it's not it's not a constraint. It's simply embracing a new a new a new a new world secondly thinking small a narrow focus on your category or on green products no the future will have to be products and services that are sustainable otherwise the license to operate is going to be in question um i like the way this is being formulated being market takers needs to stop we need to become market makers no in terms of it's not about waiting until the thing is comes baked this is about marketers understanding how you can make a, a market opportunity out of those changes the fourth one is treating sustainability as an afterthought or as an app thing you put on um, once, once the product and service has, has been defined. It's actually going to be at the core of it. And finally, being passive, just thinking that someone else is going to be fixing for you, that's not going to happen. And um, Nigel Topping, who, who is the UK um, uh, high-level climate champion, put it actually very um, um, succinctly and, and in a very encouraging way. So he, he's, he says um, it is for CMOs to become the climate activists, for CMOs to lead the way to race to zero. So this is one of those opportunities where society is actually looking to marketers to actually um, 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 join the effort. And they want more of marketing rather than less of marketing. They want marketers to step up. Um, and, and, and it was also, um, Gail, very much my perception um, in Glasgow that, that marketers we're actually welcome, um, um, provided we, are, we, we, we come with a plan, provided we, um, we're, we're committed and we're prepared to be held accountable, marketers are very much welcomed by, uh, by the different uh, stakeholders. I'd say so much so. I mean, I, and that really has changed. I, I run the, um, the SDG communications campaign, so I've been doing that since 2015. And my co-founder, Richard Curtis, has always said the big difference between 20, 2000 and 2015 was how welcome business was in this area, in this sort of area. And I think even in the last three years, marketers have gone from being not like kept out, but definitely suspected, you know, problematic, driving consumption, all those things. But there's definitely been a sea change, I think due to some very good marketing activists across the, you know, the big companies that you have in your membership and, and who have signed signatures to the pledge. I think people are not just now welcoming them. They're like desperate for them to come and make that change, as, as, as Nigel says. I mean, Nigel's not a marketer. You know, he's a policy guy. And, and yet that's that's him saying exactly what I think the sector are feeling. And I just think one other point I wanted to pick up on, just hearing you speak there, this thing about it's not okay to be passive anymore, you know, on your previous slide. it's I think it is exactly like the change that has happened in the issue of racism. You know, it's not okay now to be a non-racist. You have to be an anti-racist. And I feel that is the emergent role for marketers in the climate emergency. It's not okay to just be not doing any harm. You have to be thinking, what am I doing as a marketer to be driving a positive, you know, anti-climate crisis? Like, what am I doing positive for the world, positive for nature, rather than just, I don't seem to be doing anything bad, so I'm going to keep my head down. So I think that's what we need. We need anti-climate crisis now, not just passive. Yeah. 
And and to build on what you just said, um, I think the the condition for marketers to be welcomed is it's it's those those um, those commitments need to be uh, translated into actions. This is about action. It's an it's a decade of action given given the short time frame. We're talking about in nine years time, 2030. So this is about you know, putting into action um, 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 the commitments that, uh, that, that we've been talking about in, in Glasgow. Now, um, in, in that same survey, where we've actually asked um, um, our signatories, plan pledge signatories, to, to share with us what, what, what they think we need to be doing more of, um, it's, it's interesting that they share actually two, um, two sort of um, main themes. One is um, what needs to be done internally um, more of. And, um, and in particular, the importance of making sure that we use our voices internally to make sustainability central to the business model. Um, also an emphasis um, on a more sustainable portfolio. And if that is not always feasible immediately to be starting with smaller brands, but the importance of actually looking at, um, at the portfolio. And finally, to promote sustainability along the value chain and inspire partners. Marketers are budget holders. They have a huge influence. They can multiply their influence by leveraging um, their position in the in um, as as the budget holders uh, with respect to their supply chain, and externally, it's the um, the importance of um, communicating um, and raising awareness um, while uh, avoiding greenwashing. And I think uh, Gail's point is really important. There's there's actually the risk of greenwashing, of um, not not uh, allowing yourself as a marketer to communicate around the thing you do unless you're perfect. The thing is. Uh, perfection doesn't exist in this age, no? Um, and we're not interested in perfection. Um, stakeholders aren't expecting perfection. What they're expecting is a journey and they're expecting commitment and they're expecting a degree of transparency and accountability. So that, you know, when, when companies and brand marketers get it wrong, that's going to be part of the process. No one has ever been there before anyway. It's going to be shared publicly in a manner that is, that is open and transparent and lessons will be drawn. But um, so the importance of being able to communicate around it, because that's what society needs. We need to be getting inspired by uh, by brands and, and and brand marketers who share their um, their journey and who share on their um, on their on their ambitions. Um, there is um, also the, the the key role of marketers in in nudging consumers to more sustainable behavior. Um, that is going to be indispensable when you think about um, what I said earlier, which is half of the CO2 emission redu reductions will will come through consumer behavior change. And finally, um, um, packaging um, um, solutions are actually very important levers to help us make a difference also as, as marketers. And um, over to you, um, Dave, for this one. This is, I mean, I'm just gonna let you read that for a second because- um, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? Still here, said the Polar Bay. <laughs> I mean, it's cute, right? It's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful image by the amazing author Charlie Mackesy, and it was the last image I saw when I was leaving. Uh, it's the Goals House, is the venue that I was running up in Glasgow, and it was above the door, and I, I hadn't noticed it. And so it, it's pretty sad, right? Like it's like I came away like, oh no, but it's also pretty kind of profound. And and we, the reason I think it's really profound, and I I put it in here was. I'm really excited by what marketing can do to this crisis now, you know, and, and that's just a little beautiful piece of visual storytelling. Um, imagine what can happen if all of the incredible storytellers across all of your incredible networks and departments and agencies really got behind this. Um, because I do think this is the, this is the next big unlock. So they call them the, you know, what's the unlock? We've had the financial unlock, you know, the 123, 130 trillion, dollars of asset under management now pointing at 1.5 you know we've had the technology we're having we're living through in real time the technology unlock i mean it's incredible and and then we i don't think we've quite got into the ai unlock but that will also help some incredible technologies to really take hold but the storytelling unlock is in your hands and we really need you to tell that because you have you have all the tools you you see it happen in the world when a brand does change the story and we need the story to be changed right and we need it to be this one so that we can stop feeling like we're in a, a climate crisis and, and just totally flip this to being the, the opportunity of a generation, of almost of a species, to change the course of our, of our existence on this planet into a better direction. My, my co-founder, Richard, like I said, he, his big thing is like, we must see this as the great opportunity. You know, and we must be as excited and thrilled as those new asset managers are that they're gonna get a much better return on investment because they're gonna invest in green and not black. 
you hold the key really to turning that, uh, to unlocking that in, in the general public consciousness so that we get the behavior change, you know, so that we get the accelerated innovation and partnerships and because you create the demand for it. So I think I just would close by saying thank you again for having me, uh, Stefan, and please do all you can to become an anti-climate crisis communicator because we need you. Thank you, Gail. And um, we are uh, we have a few minutes left um, uh, for any questions uh, there we we might have from uh, from participants. Um, I um, I saw actually um, an initial comment uh, by Karen Groman saying report the full footprint of your marketing budget to be transparent. Um, I think the, the question here is around um, uh, that brand marketers will be held accountable for what is called scope three emissions um, going forward. Um, so it's not only the emissions generated by the company per se, um, nor is it only the, the emissions generated by the upstream. It is also downstream. It's actually the consumers using the product and, uh, and the CO2 emissions that is generating. That is, that is going to be what's called the scope three emissions. It's actually the, the responsive for bring that down. That is incredibly challenging and it can only be delivered through consumer behavior change, through nudging consumers, you know, to change the way they wash their clothes, to change the way they take their showers, et cetera. It's, 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 it's getting consumers in day-to-day -day life to adopt behaviors that are, that are more sustainable. Maybe a word on, on this, uh, Gail, from, from where you sit? Uh, yeah, completely. I think it is, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't shy away from that challenge just because it's hard. It is incredibly hard, but I'm, I'm going to think of um, a company like Netflix, who've recently come out and said that they are taking care of the carbon emissions of their, their scope three is how you, every time we watch one of their shows, I mean, that is an enormous undertaking, but they're doing it. So I, th I think it, it can be done. It's really difficult from this point of view, but from this perspective and point in time to work out how, but that would be on my list of just set the targets and then work out how you get there. And, and another uh, question here we have, um, I find your quote about greenwashing versus greenwashing very interesting. However, how do we address the fact that fundamentally marketers drive consumerism, which is greatly causing global warming? That's that's going to be the, the, the single biggest question we're going to be confronted with. Um, Gail, you want to have a crack at that? Yeah, I do. And it's not an easy one. And you're addressing the growth conundrum there, aren't you? And that, that goes right to the, there's just too many people on the planet answer. However, I think the quest in it, the answer is possibly in your question, which is it drives consumerism. So we need to look at what are we driving people to consume? So that comes back into the company. How are we making things? Are we changing our fundamental model from ownership to leasing, you know, the circular economy principles? we we can't stop existing <laughs> like that is going to go on and nobody if you think from an entire sustainable development perspective just crashing industries just shutting them down a bit like what happened to the pandemic in certain sectors that's not good either because that creates as much human misery and suffering on you know just it just changes the problem so i think we have to really look root and branch at what it is we're driving to people to consume and how within the role of a sort of responsible business model and then we'll get somewhere i mean i agree that is that is definitely a challenge that will come as part of being a marketer but i think just you have to just reframe what it is we're trying to get people to consume and and that that might not even be a thing it could be a habit a behavior a service you know an attitude um, but there is a whole um, there's a whole heap of like change that could happen in that concept. That doesn't mean you have to get rid of either marketing or consumers. You just have to check. You have to change what the exchange is. We have two more questions and then, then we'll close. One is, is Plant Pledge engaged um, with climate NGO activists? What is the role of industry associations in closing the gap between businesses and civil society? I'm happy to take that one. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, so we, um, we are actually dialoguing with a number of um, organizations. Uh, we've done that intensively in the run-up to COP26. Um, it's, they've played actually an important role in helping us shape the program in, in understanding what the right metrics were and how we had to hold ourselves accountable in order to be credible. Um, we have ongoing conversation now. Um, it's, um, I find it almost refreshing, the fact that they are, although they are challenging, they are actually very much very keen to work with us. And I think it's absolutely indispensable because uh, no, we, we need to be understanding um, the, um, 
the urgency of the um, of the issue by having people challenging us from the outside. Otherwise, it's going to be too comfortable, and we're not going to be we're not going to be sufficiently ambitious. So we do um, plan to, as we as we look into the future, to continue working closely with those um, NGOs. Um, the second question is: um, I think the idea of of sparking of uh, sparking behavior change is very important. Do you have any general guidance on how to approach behavior change? In communications and how do you find the right link uh, to product? That's a that's a that's a big one. Um, <laughs> Gail, you want you want to have a, a go? Right, it's the big ones. Um, well, I do look. I think behavior change is hard, definitely. Um, but but we can't move forward without it. Uh, so I think general guidance is also tricky because it's so specific. The the only generic piece of advice I would have thought would have been to start where your customer already is. You know, it's so easy to give preachy advice and, and generally, like I was saying earlier about humans don't do things because they have to, they do them because they want to. So you have to get whatever your product is. I'd go to start with the product. What is it doing in the world? Uh, who is its core user base? You know, what do we know about them? And how do we want them to change? And then the story you have to wrap around that is, why is changing my behavior going to give me more fun, a better life? You know, the world going to be better. So I think it's just getting to really know your customer and starting where they are, rather than this sort of top down advice. And like, definitely don't make it sound hard, because if, if you make it sound hard, then people aren't going to do it. It's like the, de you know, the developed world, not giving away any budget to help the developing, but make it great and then people will be flocking to you and then my second point I think on this one is to really go and try to get close to the young people again you know they they know how to change and whether that's getting them in your in on your strategic sort of planning or in on your creative development or they when I whenever I'm with them and there was a lot of them at COP and it was so exciting and I don't mean you know 12 year olds but 18 19 20 like the Gen Z's and the Millennials like Stefan was saying they are so good at this stuff. You know, they're just intuitively so great at it. So I would just make sure that they are being included in your development uh, and, and planning because they'll give you an insight that you might not get to yourself. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gail. I think we'll have to bring the webinar to close. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Gail and her colleague, Michelle, who are great partners at Project 17 for, for their support. And I'd also like to thank the WFA team, um, Hannah and Rob for the wonderful work they've been doing and they're continuing to do on the plan pledge. If I could ask for your feedback before, um, before you leave the webinar, and I'd like to thank all of you for participating in today's webinar and hope to see you very soon. We will definitely um, update you on the progress we're making on the climate agenda in the months to come. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.